Good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Hackett, Director of Development Events at Montclair State University, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining our session, Women, Wealth, Taxes, and Retirement, Five Critical Steps Every Woman Should Know. I am joined by my colleague, Ellie Santoni, Senior Director of Gift Planning at Montclair, and it's our pleasure to partner with the team from U.S. Financial Services to bring you this webinar. During this evening's session, you'll learn planning strategies and tips for financial success. So just some housekeeping, we'll take questions throughout the program. Please use the chat feature to ask a question of any of our speakers. So now let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome our esteemed speakers, uh, Jerry, Gerard, excuse me, Jerry Papetti is Partner and Managing Director of U.S. Financial Services. In this role, he guides individuals in the process of accumulating and preserving wealth. His approach to problem solving and analytical thinking enables him to recommend advanced planning strategies for individuals and business owners. He is an advocate for his clients and takes the time to truly understand their goals and bring them financial confidence. And we are proud to say that Jerry is an alumnus of Montclair State University. Al Gobo is Partner and Managing Director of U.S. Financial Services also. Al has the ability to demystify the financial planning experience for his clients and addresses economic, psychological, and emotional concerns. And he's appeared as a guest speaker on CNBC, NBC, ABC, MSNBC, Fox News, Fox Business, Bloomberg, and CNN. He is also an alumnus of Montclair and says he has come to realize that true success is measured by family, friends, and the satisfying feeling of knowing he's helped someone. And Christina DeZadzio is a financial advisor with U.S. Financial Services, as she is an alumna of Pace University and earned a degree in computer science. After years of study and exams covering financial retirement and estate planning disciplines, she's achieved the Chartered Financial Consultant Designation Award by uh, the American College of Financial Services. So welcome again to our speakers. And now I will turn it to Christina to kick us off. Thank you, Karen. Uh, have you gone ahead and shared our screen? Okay, wonderful. Oh, there we are. Great. Thank you so much for that. So what we're looking at here is just sort, sort of our contact information. It really is very nice to see everyone here today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you do have any questions that are specific uh, to any of the information that we're going over, we do ask that you go ahead and put them into the chat box. We're going to have an opportunity at the end of, of our presentation to go ahead and cover those questions. If there are anything that's too specific um, and not appropriate for the, uh, the, the meeting here today, then you can certainly um, direct those questions to us and we'll be more than happy to address them for you uh, off air. So there are five critical steps that we're going to be covering. Um, one of those items is going to be saving for financial independence. We'll get uh, deeper into each of these topics. Liability and risk management, diversification of your investment portfolio and your savings, uh, being aware of pitfalls that you could potentially experience, and when and how to seek professional guidance. Um, again, our goal is to really start this conversation because these are very broad topics and there's a lot of information to go over. Um, so our hope is that you'll leave today with some ideas that you can apply to your situation uh, as you go throughout your retirement planning journey. The information that we're looking at here, and this is what we'll start, is a Transamerica Institute for Retirement Studies poll. And what this shows us is um, of all the people that were asked the question, whether they strongly, somewhat, uh, agree, uh, somewhat disagree or strongly disagree with the statement, I don't have enough income to save for retirement. The results of this poll showed us that 57% of women feel that they don't have enough income to save for retirement, while only 46% of their male counterparts felt the same. This reminded me of a story of a client that I worked with for a very, very long time. Um, she worked as an administrative assistant for her entire career never earned more than $50,000 a year uh, throughout her entire working life and managed to pass away with multi-million dollars in her investment portfolio. 
So really what that story told me and, and what it's able to, to sort of teach us is having a, a decent balance between your lifestyle and your earnings can really help to be an equivalent to your success. Uh, it's not necessarily about how much you make. Uh, it's really about starting with small and disciplined incremental savings. Um, so you don't need a windfall. You don't need to start off with a large lump sum to get your portfolio going. But scheduling automatic contributions to your retirement plan or your investment portfolio will make it easy and sort of take the guesswork out of things. You know, Christina, I read an interesting statistic um, about that the baby boomer generation, right? The uh, youngest women right now are turning 59 as far as that whole generation. So there's a lot of planning to be done over the next 10 years. Absolutely. Um, also sticking with the Transamerica Institute for Retirement Studies, they did another poll. Um, and in this particular poll, they were looking to ascertain how much retirement savings people, folks have, have in their uh, investment portfolios. Um, and the results of this were really interesting in that it shows us that women on average have about $43,000 saved for retirement, while their men, male counterparts have more than double that, 91,000. Now, those are pretty small amounts, depending on how old they are and how close they are to retirement. But what was even more alarming is the percentage of women that have saved nothing. And as you can see there in that dark blue box down at the bottom, 10% of women polled in this particular survey had nothing saved towards retirement. Um, one of the comments that I do want to sort of elicit here or bring out is that poverty in our country has a distinct feminine face. The largest growing segment of our population is a poor elderly woman. So the very next question that we should ask then is where should you be uh, in order to be able to, to gauge um, where you are with regard to saving for retirement? Um, so we pull up for you here, just a general rule of thumb. If you take a look at the bottom part of this slide, you'll see ages. Um, and then above that, there's a multiple of your salary. So for example, if you were age 55, which is right there smack in the middle of the slide, and you're earning a gross salary of $100,000 a year, the general rule of thumb is that by this age, you should have six to eight times your salary saved. Uh, Christina, if uh, some of our uh, attendees are looking at this and let's say that they may not be exactly on target where these uh, age and amounts break out, should they be concerned? I would say no. Uh, I think starting off with feeling like you are a little bit behind and that you need to start making some changes to get going in the right direction, that's a great place to start. I wouldn't be alarmed. Um, we're going to certainly go over some things that you can start to do or think about in order to get yourself on track. And I would really be remiss if we didn't talk about some unique planning issues that are specific to women. <clears throat> One of those issues is, is longevity. Women outlive men in every country while still earning less. Uh, that means that a woman's portfolio is going to have to produce income for a longer period of time. She'll have to pay for healthcare costs and prescription costs for a longer period of time. Also, along with that is a salary disparity. So even though the salary gap has been closing, women still earn an estimated 82 cents for every dollar that a man earns. Uh, so women have to save a larger percentage of their earnings in order to fully fund their retirement. And finally, there's the family or caregiver aspect of this situation. Women leave the workforce an average of 13 years to raise their family or to care for an aging loved one, on average, women spend 27 years in the workforce compared to their male counterparts that spend about 40. So then the question, when should we start planning for retirement is really a, a trick question. The best answer is the day you get your first paycheck, um, but the best answer is today. You wanna save early and save often, and you wanna make sure that you're paying yourself 
make that a priority. That's sort of a motto that we all have here at US Financial is uh, telling or encouraging a client or a person that we're working with, um, just like you pay your ordinary ongoing lifestyle expenses, a mortgage or a rent bill, uh, electricity bill, grocery bill, you wanna set some, some uh, of your earnings aside for savings as well. Yeah, that's, I think, extremely important, Christina, that uh, you should get into the mindset of paying yourself first. Because I, I think when uh, our income gets into that checking account, everybody wants a piece of it, right? So um, I think it's wise to take care of yourself first and then, uh, you know, be able to, uh, you know, uh, plan for retirement that way. Agreed. What we have here for you is a video uh, by our colleague, Louise Albert, who's also an advisor on the US financial team. She is going to share an experience that she recalls working with one woman in particular. In the many years that I've spent working with women planning for their retirement, it's one theme that remains ever present. It's that it's never too late to start. It reminds me of a client, her name was Ellie. Ellie had a career in academia, but never a tenure track position. It wasn't until the age of 50, after her kids were, were grown, but still caring for an aging mom, Ellie was able to focus on her retirement savings over the next 15 to 20 years. This was done through her employer's plan, as well as personal savings on her own. At the age of 70, Ellie was able to fully retire. Although maybe not a millionaire, Ellie was able to maintain her current standard of living throughout her retirement and felt really good about doing that, even at starting at a, the late age of 50. So I think the most important message that I took away from that particular video was that, you know, again, it's just, it's never too late to start. Um, I think the best time to start planning for retirement is today if you haven't done so already. Um, so you want to figure out how you can start to pay yourself first, how you can start to, um, to take some of that salary and defer that into your retirement plan. Um, and make those the cash balance that you've been growing at the bank a little bit more productive for yourself yep so christina you mentioned earlier about you know the best time to start really was the first paycheck you got and uh, to give you an example if you're 25 years old and you put away a hundred dollars a month into the s p at age 65 typical retirement age you would have a million dollars if you wait till you're 35 years old and you do the same thing at age 65, you'll have $300,000. So now if your goal is a million dollars and you're 35 or older, okay, you would have to readjust and rethink how much you're going to put away every month. So this brings up, you know, a very interesting phrase that we have called, what is worse, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret? And we all know what the answer to that is. So just because we may not have been disciplined at 25, I know I wasn't, all right? Mm -hmm. We could certainly become more disciplined today, or tomorrow, or as soon as possible. So to your next, the second best time is now. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, thank you, Al. I agree with that. You know, just because you weren't disciplined saving $100 a month when you were 25 years old doesn't necessarily mean that um, you miss the boat, that you're just, you're not able to plan for retirement. It simply means that you kind of have to tighten those, those buckle, those buckle straps, and you have to really uh, get serious about saving, probably having to save more in order to amass the same wealth that you would have if you started sooner. But mm -hmm. it certainly doesn't completely put you out of the, the ability to plan for retirement. Yeah. So when we, we look at planning, I mean, you use the word planning several times. And I think, you know, it, it, all of this starts with a plan. 
you need to focus and develop a plan. I mean, don't try to do this haphazardly and, and just you know willy nilly invest in the stock of the day or whatever. Develop a plan. You know, take a look at what you're investing for, whether it's to buy a house or or, or retirement or whatever, and then look at that plan and, and take a look at the liabilities that that plan brings to you. Um, and we look at things in a simple form. For example, there's only three things that can happen to all of us. We live forever, we die prematurely, or we incur some kind of disability due to accident or sickness. Well, live forever, we know is impossible, but we could certainly live to a ripe old age. You know, there are more uh, centenarians today than, than ever before. And there are many people um, there's a person in my building here in Florida who's 87 years old and he bikes 50 miles every other day, all right? And he's down at the gym lifting weights, et cetera. So uh, what we think of as old, maybe, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago is certainly not old. So you could live forever. You just don't want to run out of money. Well, die prematurely, that means yesterday, okay? If you died yesterday, what would your affairs look like? and run yourself through that program. You can't change anything. You died yesterday. What would, you, what would your situation look like? What would your family uh, situation look like? And then certainly today with, with sicknesses and accidents uh, that you read about and hear, and we all know someone who, who, who was in an accident or did become sickly and they couldn't work anymore. Uh, um, what does that do to the family? So if you look at the types of risk, you know, we certainly are aware of the risk we take in property and casualty. All of us have some kind of uh, homeowner insurance, renter insurance, auto insurance, et cetera. Um, but before we decide to, to buy insurance, we take a look at what does risk mean and what choices do we have with risk? Well, you could certainly avoid risk. So if I don't want to buy car insurance, for example, I don't have to have a car. I avoid the risk. We could reduce the risk. Yeah, I want to buy a car, but I don't want to drive it that much. And I'm only going to drive, you know, two blocks a day. So you could reduce the risk. I could wear seatbelts, have an airbag. Uh, I could transfer the risk. That's when I send it, you know, my risk, the uh, economic part of my risk over to an insurance company. And then finally, I can accept the risk. And what does that mean? It's on me. If something happens, I'm liable, I'm responsible. So you can understand that with property and casualty because it's a finite, it's a tangible thing. Look at that with our own life, okay? What risk do we take? Do we avoid, reduce, transfer, or accept it, okay? We look at disability. Most of us, if we were disabled for a very short period of time, a week or two, it probably wouldn't change our lives that much. But what about long-term disability? Okay. And the thing today, what about long-term care? Every one of us, I'm sure, knows of someone who was in a long-term care situation. Okay. And I, I have personal experience with, with, with a deep friend, a good friend of mine that just passed away. Uh, but my mother-in-law, who's 93, we think she's 93. We really don't know. But she said she's 93. Um, she's been in long-term care for the last five years, full-time, 365 day, 24 seven care, okay? Uh, and, and that becomes expensive, all right? And then finally, you know, and, and when you look at your personal life, you know, what if one gets divorced, separated? Um, again, that changes your life drastically. You know, Al, I recently heard someone say that marriage is about love. And divorce is about money. So it's good to come up with an agreement, um, which is called a prenuptial agreement. That's pre your, you know, pre pre um, exchanging nuptials. Um, that you come up to, uh, you come to an agreement together while you still like each other. <laughs> you decide who gets what and what's going to happen if, in the event, you both decide that you've grown away from each other or you no longer are in love with one another. Um, but if you are already married, it's not too late. There's also a post-nuptial agreement that allows you to put this, a similar agreement in place after uh, nuptials have already been shared. So that's definitely something to consider. Absolutely. And, and I love that saying, you know, uh, 
marriage is about love and, and divorce is about money. And I, I could say this because my wife's not here, but marriage is about money too. Um, <laughs> anyway, we could move on. So I think one of the big lessons when we're looking to develop savings is diversification. And very simply put, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, diversification. So we look at the types of, of um, savings that are available and none of these take precedent over the other. They're all important. And we all probably have some type of savings in each bucket. So we, if we look at the after-tax bucket, that's the money we get after our paycheck. We get the paycheck in our hand, taxes are taken out, and that's the net amount that we have. And once we pay our bills, buy whatever, whatever's left over, typically we get to invest, all right? And as someone said earlier, we should make that a priority, the last part, and pay yourself first and maybe say the first 10% of my paycheck, I'm gonna put away. But th that numbers and everything become you know, a, a concern and, and an issue once you sit down and develop your plan and you can see how much you can put away. The second bucket is tax deferred. What does that mean? Well, it's an account where you put dollars in, the dollars grow, okay? Whether they're in a fixed account like a CD or, or, or a, uh, um, um, an investment account, stock bonds, whatever and they grow and you don't pay tax while it's in that bucket, but you do pay tax when it comes out. What's a typical example? Your IRA, okay? You don't pay tax while it's growing, but when you start taking distribution, you're gonna pay tax on that money. And the last bucket is tax advantage, all right? And tax advantage, really when you think about it, are things like retirement plans, your IRA, your 401k, et cetera, education plans, today, 529 plans that are tax advantage. Okay, you could put money away for a child's education and the money comes out tax free if it's used for education. Uh, health savings plans, all right, also are tax advantage plans. Now, in each of these buckets, you get to choose what investments you wanna make. So even in the after tax bucket, you have a choice to kind of make it some kind of tax advantage by investing in things like municipal bonds, which are tax free, annuities, which are tax deferred, limited partnership or unit investment trusts that have tax advantages. Okay. And so when you, when you look at each one of these buckets, you will probably realize that you have one of these at least. And many of you probably have all three buckets. Okay. You know, I'll just, uh, you know, when you look at the types of savings that you've, you know, pointed out, one of, you know, our principles uh, is tax planning and tax efficiency. So, you know, when we look at someone's ability to save um, and how to invest, there are four basic uh, tax principles that each of us have available to us. And the first one is deduct, right? What, what can we deduct for purposes of reducing our tax burden? And the tax law has changed since the 2017 Tax Act that has kind of uh, uh, reduced that category, but there are still certain things that you can deduct. The next one is defer, and that's just pushing the tax off until a future point in time. And the most common one is your IRA, maybe your 401k. Uh, you mentioned tax deferred annuities. so. A deferral. Uh, the next one is uh, to convert, and that's uh, taking what would be a taxable uh, a part of taxable income and converting it to a tax free, right? Uh, and then the last one is divert, and was with a client the other day um, looking, uh, the 529 plan was fully depleted. Uh, the client was a business owner and asked, you know, any strategies that we can maybe fund the last, uh, I don't know, two years of the college. And one of the items that they have as a business owner is to put the child on the payroll. Um, you know, they're in a lower bracket and uh, they, uh, you know, possibly uh, could, you know, save a considerable amount of income taxes. And then there's some other planning that has to go along with that. But that was just one of the ways that you can divert income maybe to a lower tax bracket. Mm -hmm. Super. 
So then we look at our retirement income and where it's going to come from. And basically, for most people, it's going to come from three sources. Your retirement plan that you have, which we already discussed, your IRA, 401k, 403b, et cetera. Um, your Social Security, okay, which they say is going to be around for a little while longer. We hope that's true. All right. And then your personal investments, which we discussed. All three of these investment vehicles are going to be available when you retire. And interestingly enough, you look at deposits, accumulation, and distributions. As you see, hopefully, and if you've invested for a while, your distribution amount is going to be much larger than the amount that you deposited over time. So many of you that have savings plans or retirement plans now, take a look at the, the amount of dollars that are in the plan. And hopefully you'll agree that there's much more money in there than you put in. The question becomes, of these three stacks of money, which stack do you want to pay tax on at distribution time? Okay, so obviously, if you look at the stacks, I would think most people would pick, I would like to pay tax on the smallest pile. In reality, in an IRA of 403B, we wind up paying tax on the largest pile, right? Because we got a tax deduction for our contribution. It grew tax deferred, which is our accumulation. But then at distribution time, we paid the tax. So distribution time is as early as 59 and a half, okay? And as late as, Jerry? And as late as 72. 72, yes, thank 70. you. All yeah, right. 70 this year. Which, which is called RMD, required minimum distribution. It means that even if you don't want to take the money out because you don't want to pay the tax, Uncle Sam says, no, too bad. You must take the required amount out. So you look at this and you say, well, why the heck do I have a traditional retirement plan? Well, why? Because it still makes sense. But it may not be the only plan that you should have for retirement. So many of you have heard the term Roth, whether it's a Roth IRA, a Roth 401k, and the Roth works the opposite of a traditional IRA. You don't get a tax deduction for your contribution, but your distributions come out tax-free. So for those of us that are a little older and are approaching distribution age, many of us wish that that distribution could come out tax-free today but we enjoyed the benefits of the tax deduction on the contribution, so we really can't complain. So the moral of the story here, I think, is diversification. You can have several types of plans. You can have plans that tax you at the end, plans that you're taxed on in the beginning, so that when you do take distribution, you can enjoy tax-free and taxable income. I think you hit you know, a, a really good point there is to have you know, different pockets, right? Based upon what may be the situation at the time, because all of the planning you do with retirement uh, accounts is to accumulate wealth and then the distribution to pay the least amount of tax. Um, uh, realizing that um, the uh, funds that you can use at retirement, um, you may be in a different state, right? So um, that also has to come into play as far as state taxation to determine what may be the most appropriate um, point uh, or the way to save. Uh, one item that has been thrown out as far as potential um, changes in the tax law, uh, those who earn a certain amount of, uh, of an income may be limited as to what they can put into a Roth IRA, right? They, they may have certain income limitations, particularly if they're part of a retirement plan. And some may have heard of uh, a strategy called the backdoor Roth IRA, which uh, can be available to just about any taxpayer. So, um, you know, there are opportunities for those to start a Roth IRA and accumulate in a Roth IRA. So the time that you retire, you may have that other pocket of wealth uh, that may have a tax uh, preferential way to get income out. And there was also a comment that came in in the chat here 
Uh, required minimum distributions are delayed if you continue to work for the employer where your retirement plan resides. As long as you are not more than 5% owner of that company, you can defer required minimum distributions. That's correct. Okay, so now we take a look at portfolio diversification, which is not this slide, but this one. Okay, and after you've chosen the type of retirement plan or savings plan that you want, you then have to choose the type of investments that you want in that vehicle. And I still find it somewhat amusing where, you know, people even today, they say, well, I have an IRA. I said, well, what are you invested in? They say, it's an IRA. And I said, no, no, the IRA is the vehicle, but the investment that's tucked under that tax deferred umbrella could be anything. It could be CDs, whatever. So the vehicle that you choose is one thing, the fuel that drives the engine is the actual investments that you put in there. And those investments, again, should be diversified. As we said before, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So how do you determine what your portfolio should look like? Well, on one end of the spectrum, you could just invest however, and hopefully over a period of time, it's diversified. And hopefully those investments are in line with your goals and objectives, et cetera. Okay, and that requires a certain amount of luck. And if you believe in luck, God bless you, that's what you could do. On the other side of the spectrum, why not create a plan? And the plan will dictate to you what type of investments you should employ. So if you're planning, let's say for retirement, you're gonna look at certain criteria, all right? Your criteria that you're gonna look at today is how old are you, okay? Your goal is retirement, okay? What's the time horizon? So if you're 50 and you wanna retire at 60, you have a 10 year time horizon. And what risk are you willing to take? What's your tolerance for risk? What's your risk appetite? Because I love when people say, you know, my friend told me last year, everybody was down in the stock market, but he was up 50%. Wow, that's unbelievable. What did he invest in? I don't know. And then you find out he put all his money in some very speculative type of investment that happened to do well last year. And yeah, that could happen. But are you willing to take that risk? Are you willing to push all those chips into the middle of the table? So in addition to retirement goals, what are your other goals? All right? They're going to be either short, mid or long term. You want to buy that house down the shore or a house in Florida or whatever, your child's education. Um, your, you know, a new car, uh, whatever you want to invest for, and ultimately retirement. So retirement usually is the longer range goal, and all those others are short to medium range. Well, you're going to match up your uh, um, goals with the types of investments you make. So short goals, short term goals, short term investments. Okay, we know that real estate typically is a very good investment. Okay, even though it's illiquid. All right, but it's a long-term investment. You don't buy a house today, an uh, investment home today, investment property for your child's education next year. All right, you might buy that today for a goal that you might have 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, a very wise man once wrote a book that compared, you know, financial planning and golf. And you know, he looked at his golf bag and saw that there were 14 clubs in the bag and said, well, wow, I have 14 clubs. I wonder why. Well, because the big club, the driver was used to hit it long distance and the small club, the putter was used to hit it short distance. All right. Uh, but if you have a game like mine, I sometimes putt longer than I drive, but that's a different story. Okay. So you look at the 14 clubs, they're all different. And that's called diversification. So to give you that analogy of what diversification looks like, that's what it also should look like in your portfolio. Short-term goals should match short-term investments. Long-term goals should match long-term investments. Al, yeah. I, I need to put you on the spot there. I just wanted to ask Al a question. Uh, so you mentioned coming up with a plan. How, how do you think that it would be appropriate to, to start? Where do you start coming up with a, a plan? How do you start or when do you start? I didn't hear you. 
How? How, how, how does one go about, you, you know, I, I have this idea that I want to start planning for retirement. I'm compelled to do that because this wonderful presentation gave me some good insight. Um, where, where do I start? Okay, well, listen, like everything else, the choices are unlimited. Um, you have people that, you know, DIY, do it yourself, right? Get out a piece of paper and start jotting down your goals, objectives, et cetera, and start creating a plan. On the other side of the spectrum, you say, well, you know what? I could do it myself, but that may not have been uh, working out too good for me lately. So you might seek some advice and you start with people that you know. Everybody has an accountant. Everybody has an attorney uh, that they know, uh, uh, friends that they know. Try to get referrals from people that say, you know, who do you know that can help me in this arena? So if someone were to come to us, as an example, um, the way you start plan is by collecting two basic types of information. One is quantitative, which is numbers. How much numbers, how much money do you have and where is it? Put that to the side because that's easy. The other is qualitative. What's your dream? What do you want to happen? What are your goals? And how can we make your goals happen? So that person that waited, that didn't start at 25 with $100 a month, who's now 50, Obviously, he can't put $100 a month in and reach the same goal. So he may have to either lighten the goal down from a 1 million to less than 1 million or increase the investment from $100 a month to some other amount. So it starts with conversation and really getting to know the person that you're with. It, it, it's not dissimilar than going to your doctor. You know, your doctor is going to take all the information from you your blood work, your blood pressure, your this, your that, everything. And he's got it all right here. And he's got it in that little file that he grabs right before he comes into the room to examine you. And so he grabs and he looks at it. And then he says something to you. Usually he says, so why are you here? And to me, sometimes that's the most important question. And we ask that question to our clients when they come in, our prospective clients. Why are you here? Tell me what's going on. And the number part of it is easy. I mean, you know, if you go to 100 financial planners, they probably use a very similar software or whatever to crunch numbers. Okay, same as accounting. All right. But you need to find someone who has empathy and sympathy with you that's willing to sit down and listen to you and find out what you want out of the relationship. And the question begins with, why are you here? What do you want from a relationship? that we could develop. Al, uh, there's a question about how do you uh, prepare uh, for an initial meeting uh, or a consultation? And I think we're gonna cover that uh, a little bit later in this program. Mm -hmm. So we, we covered diversification. We looked at the various kinds of portfolios and everything from low risk the high risk, so you could be 100% in short term. You know, if, if you would have said this five years ago, you'd say you're crazy. 100% in, in, in money markets and CDs, they were paying zero. Why would I do that? Well, today they're paying three, four, maybe 5% in some places. So there's not a bad place to, to, to put some dry powder, to put some money. I'm not sure I would do 100%, but that's determined by your plan. On the other side of the equation, you have, uh, you know, you could have 100% in, in, in speculative stock. You know, I know someone who uh, was very, very, um, made a lot of money in something called Bitcoin. I still don't understand Bitcoin 100%, and I would not be willing to make large investments in something like that. To me, the risk is, is too high for me, but you could do that if, if your risk appetite is such. But a normal portfolio, a typical moderate growth portfolio, and most of you have heard this already, and it's kind of boring, you know, 60-40, 60% in equities, 40% in fixed income. Now, the trick is, what kind of equities, what kind of stocks would you want to buy, and what kind of fixed income do you want to have in your portfolio? As I said before, you could have short, mid, long term. So if you're, even if you're buying bonds, you don't want to put all your money in long-term bonds, or short-term bonds for that matter. So the idea is to develop the plan and then find the right mix of investments that will fit your uh, requirement in your plan. 
Warning, warning. Okay. Pitfalls. Um, step number four. <laughs> I think, um, you know, oh, I think we went One to, of the we, biggest warnings we have for you ladies is that a man is not a plan. And I think that a lot of you realize that, which is the reason why you're asking these questions. Don't rely on your husband, your father, your uncle, your grandfather um, to, to provide you with the, the nest egg that you need to live a comfortable lifestyle in retirement. Um, you want to be able to take control over that and plan that out for yourself. So a man is not a plan. So we still need Christina to be aware of the pitfalls though, because just because a man may not be a plan, okay, what are some of the other pitfalls that we have to address? Well, some of the other pitfalls that we've actually experienced in working with our clients is um, a, a person who says, you know what, I'm just gonna work until I pass away. I don't really need to plan for retirement because my plan is to work until for, for my entire life, lifetime. And, and that's simply not a retirement plan. There are so many things that could happen over the course of one's lifetime that will derail that plan. Uh, so working until death is not a retirement plan. Uh, you need to be able to plan for a potential disability, plan for you know, the fact that maybe you, phys you physically cannot perform your duties of your job uh, for that period of time, or the desire just leaves um, because we do change over time. Another item that we find to be a pitfall as we're planning for our clients is that you're likely going to live longer than you anticipate. Uh, we, are, we talked about a centennials, lots of centennials that we're working with. I just spoke with a fellow yesterday who's 99 years old. Um, unfortunately, he just uh, lost his wife who was also very late in her 90s as well. Um, but the fact is that you're probably gonna live longer than you anticipate. When we take a look at the average lifespan uh, in the United States here, that includes everyone and all walks of life, whether you have resources or health uh, health care access. The fact is that if you have resources and monetary assets and you have health care, the chances of you living a little bit beyond that life expectancy of, of average life expectancy is, is greater. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, the, uh, the more gray hair I get, uh, as long as I have hair, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I'm not talking to Jerry here, but um, the more gray hair I have, the more people ask me, Al, when are you retiring? And it's funny because I don't look at retirement as something that's a magical age or magical, you know, a bell goes off. To me, you know, retirement means the ability to not have to work. So, if I'm financially secure or if you're financially secure and, and you don't have to work, well, that's kind of a, you know, I could retire, but it doesn't mean you have to. And retiring doesn't mean you have to not work at all. I mean, maybe instead of, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, you want to cut it down some. Maybe instead of five, seven days a week, you want to work less. Maybe instead of 12 months, you want to work, you know, 10 months. So retirement can mean a lot of different things. And it also depends on what you do for a living. You know, my friend Manny, who lives around the corner, is a uh, um, Portuguese stonemason. And if you touch his arms, they're like rocks. But he lifts heavy stones every day. His knees are giving in, his elbow, his elbows. I mean, Manny may not have a choice, you know, at some point than not work because physically may not be able to, okay? Um, me personally, I don't lift anything heavy. I don't dig ditches. I don't climb scaffolding. So I don't have to worry about breaking down right now. I just have to worry about how long do I want to do this? And right now, I don't have that time, you know, consideration. So... Retirement means something very different than it did years ago. Um, also, some of the pitfalls, one of them in particular, is to avoid bad debt. And why do we say bad debt? Well, because especially in this country, you know, you have good and bad debt. And good debt is something like your mortgage. Okay. Most people could not afford to buy a home unless they were able to get a mortgage. Okay. And, you know, in European countries, many people inherit a home from their 
parents who inherited from their parents, who inherited from their parents, okay? In this country, eh, it doesn't happen that often. So most people need to develop or get or, or, or uh, get a mortgage. And that's good then because it's somewhat tax deductible, even though less and less over the last few years with the salt deduction, et cetera, but it's a good debt. You know, what's a bad debt? Well, a bad debt, the thing that comes to mind right away is credit card debt. I mean, some credit cards are charging over 20% annual interest, okay? And if you only pay the bare minimum, you never get out from under. So you may start it with 10,000 on your uh, Visa, MasterCard, whatever, okay? And now it's up to more than that because you didn't pay more than the minimum and the interest just compounded. So you wanna avoid bad debt as much as possible. And when you do a plan, when you set your plan up, one of the things that you'll discover is that if you do have bad debt, there are ways to get out of the bad debt Okay, so that we can eliminate one less bad thing in your financial life. Yeah, and uh, the last item on here, uh, and something that is, uh, I think, a topic uh, of discussion over the past uh, couple of years. Oddly enough, um, coming out of the Great Recession in 2008, all the way through 2019, um, inflation was not as far as a uh, planning item, uh, a significant concern because it averaged basically below 2% per year. Now, inflation certainly has, um, you know, increased uh, sharply. Um, oops. As a matter of fact, it peaked, uh, inflation peaked, as we know right now in June of last year at 9.1%. Uh, we got inflation really down to about 5% right now. And, and what's uh, some, you know, good news uh, is that um, the uh, producer price index came in at only 2.7% year over year uh, through March. So that is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a trend that looks like inflation may have peaked last June. What you have on the slide here is kind of funny. Uh, this is from uh, that well-read paper called the Pittsburgh Press. It was uh, you know, high circulation back in 1970. You've got some uh, numbers up there and just kind of to those of you who uh, do the shopping, um, you probably get a, a, you know, a chuckle out of some of these numbers, but uh, a, 20 a 25 pound bag of flour was $1.77 back in 1970. And uh, that 25 pound bag of flour as of uh, the end of 2022 was thirteen dollars and sixty five cents. So that that's up about over seven hundred and seventy percent since that time. Believe it or not, over the past fifty three years, fifty two years, it's only uh, only it's a three point nine percent annual increase. So you have you know bananas at eight cents a pound and um, all these items that were significantly uh, you know what appears to be inexpensive at the time. And then over on the right side of this chart. This was a study done in 2018. And what it shows is the green uh, cost that you see there uh, were the dollars that would be spent on milk or gas or an auto or college um, in 2018. And this was a, a projection done in 2018 of what the cost of those items would be 30 years from 2018 and 2048. And so, um, just to give you some comparative purposes, some of these costs have certainly been uh, reached, uh, you know, over the past year or so. Um, I know that uh, if you're one of the lucky ones to live in California, you might have paid above $5.70 uh, for a gallon of gas. Um, you know, the uh, auto, I just, uh, you know, looked at what's the average cost of an auto heading into 2023. Well, you see the average cost uh, by car and driver, 2018 was $33,560. The average cost right now heading into uh, 2023 was $48,000, okay? And that's a 7.5% increase just since 2018 to 2023. So inflation is something that we have to account for as we you know, work through a financial plan. 
because one of the things you want to always maintain is your purchasing power. So those who like to put the, you know, savings under the mattress, just take a look at this, um, you know, at various rates at a 2% inflation rate in 25 years, the 50,000 buys you 30,000. Uh, only a 1% increase at 3%. It's roughly cut more or in half. 50,000 only buys about 24,000. And then 4% inflation, about 19,000. So you can see what happens to your purchasing power and the, and the ability for you to can, uh, keep pace with inflation. And that's uh, very important as you start to project out 10, 15, 20, 25 years to life ex expectancy how uh, inflation can have a significant impact on your ability to retire. So that's one of the items that we spend time with and make sure that you understand how to invest to provide hedges against inflation and keep pace with inflation. So the fifth step is really to seek professional guidance. And um, I know that, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, doing your taxes, um, depending upon how complicated your situation may be, most of the time you're gonna to look to a professional um, because of the complexity. Um, the other items, retirement planning and estate planning, uh, those areas, um, while you may have uh, you know, the ability and the analytical uh, wherewithal to plan on the retirement side, as far as what your capital may look like and what uh, you may need to retire, uh, I think it's always good to have someone to bounce that off of. Uh, I think it's good to have a financial coach, a CFO, somebody that's going to be with you every year. I mean, one of the things that we have a practice at US, U.S. Financial Services, and boy, how the years fly out, and Christina, don't they? Um, you know, we take a snapshot of everybody's net worth at the beginning of every year, and we look back you know, where do we say, Alan, Christina, you're going to be in 2023, right? Back in 2013. And here we are in 2023. And we look to see, is your plan on track? Are there concerns? Are there certain, uh, you know, events that happen that may have uh, derailed your plan? And so we always want to compare projected to actual results and make sure that we have a good understanding, uh, you know, where are you in relation to uh, the plan that we set up? And so that thing, I think is very important. One of the exercises that we bring to the table as far as professional guidance. Um, estate planning is another area. Um, we like to, uh, you know, put this chart in front of our clients. And, uh, you know, if something happened to you or you and your spouse, uh, how would you want uh, your estate to be distributed? So, uh, Christina and Al, I can honestly say in, in my career, I don't think I've ever seen a number be put in that right circle. Um, I don't know about each of you, but uh, as far as taxation, that usually ends up to be a zero. Um, we do have clients that have uh, charitable inclinations and want to have some uh, component of planned giving in their estate plan. And so, uh, we'd like you to fill in what percentages? Sometimes it's a hundred to the hundred percent of family and zero is zero, or maybe it's a uh, you know a part of the estate that goes to charity. And when you bring in charity, there are certainly uh, very very good tax planning strategies that can uh, you know save income taxes today, save estate taxes um, in the future. This is just a list of um, planned giving strategies. Outright gifting, that's something you may give to your charitable organizations throughout the course of the year, right? And that, uh, you know, is, um, you know, a deduction. Uh, depends on where you are relative to uh, your itemized deductions versus your standard deduction. Sometimes outright gifting may provide zero tax benefit because your standard deduction is uh, in excess of your cumulative itemized deductions. I don't wanna to get too involved with the weeds here, but that's where a bunching of your charitable donations may make sense. Instead of giving 10,000 a year, each and every year, maybe it makes sense to give 20,000 in one year and skip a year because you may be able to get a, uh, you know, a greater tax benefit. 
um, qualified charitable distributions. This is something that certainly can save taxes. Uh, if you have attained the age of 70 and a half, you have the ability um, to give up to $100,000 annually from your IRA, from your IRA to a qualified charitable organization. And while you do not get a deduction for that 100,000 or whatever you may want to take out of your IRA, um, you don't pay income tax. This qualified charitable distribution uh, strategy was originally coordinated with required minimum distributions. When you attained age 70 and a half, you had to start taking money out. Right now it's age 73. Um, or as one of the uh, you know attendees pointed out, if you're less than a 5% owner and you're still working, you can continue to defer your RMDs, required minimum distributions. But qualified charitable distributions certainly could be a way to give to charity at a very tax efficient uh, way. Uh, life insurance, now we've had clients, right, that uh, buy a policy, have the charity be the owner and the beneficiary, and they pay the premiums and they get a tax deduction for the premium, right? Um, Jerry, let, me give, let me give you a quick example to put things in perspective. So we had a client, and this goes back, you know, 15 years ago, and um, he wanted, when we did his estate plan, he felt a desire, a strong desire to give something to his alma mater because he said, by graduating college, um, you know, it, it helped me, in his words, go from the mail room to the boardroom. And he became very successful financially. And when we put a plan together, he wanted to give a large sum of money. Well, it wound up that he gave the university $10 million but he never wrote a check for $10 million, all right? The most accumulated contributions he made to that strategy was less than a million dollars. Then he passed away and he got a deduction for that million dollars during his lifetime and the university got $10 million tax-free. So you talk about leveraging a gift, this is an unbelievable strategy that if you're looking to give, um, you know, to charity, to your church, to your synagogue, to whatever, to your university. Um, and Jerry and I are both alumni of, of uh, the great Montclair State University. And I know when uh, we were reviewing each other's plans, we have intentions to, uh, I don't know about, you know, I can't afford 10 million, Jerry can, but, um, we, you know, we definitely have the university in mind, you know, to do some charitable contribution work there. So before you just write a check, think about a strategy that can leverage your check, help you and the university at the same time. Great point, Al. So just Jerry, some other strategies. I just want to call your attention. We've got two minutes left. So I just want to, we, we might have to hit a little fast forward there. Yeah. So there are other strategies donor advised fund, transferring the remainder interest in a personal residence, certain uh, trusts that you can create and a, a family foundation, all uh, worth considering depending upon what type of plan giving you wanna do. So to kind of, you know, take a look at one of the questions, you know, how do you go about the initial meeting? We've got a five-step process and it really is the ability for us to get to know you, you to get to know us, Discovery is the initial meeting where you complete a questionnaire. We gather information about your situation, documents that uh, you may want us to review. We put together what's known as an exploration study. It's a, uh, a snapshot of your uh, current situation, and it has uh, certain observations and pre pre preliminary thoughts that we might have on your situation. If we move forward with the plan, we chart the course, we develop the comprehensive plan. And then one of the nice things about engaging uh, professional guidance is uh, the heavy lifting, uh, you, you know, is done by the advisors, right? Um, you get on the track and we move everything through uh, so that your plan is comprehensive and um, covers all of your goals and objectives. And then we implement the plan after it's uh, been developed and then we review it and stay the course. So that's a, a process that we found very successful in, in our practice. Um, and that's really the initial meeting is the discovery 
uh, to do, you know, get to know each other. Okay, Al, I know you want to take credit for this quote, but I, I couldn't put your name at the bottom. Sorry. You're on mute, Al. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, how about now? Sorry about that. So I, you know, it's a great quote and, and I can't, cannot take credit for it. Um, um, although they say that if you copy one person's words, it's plagiarism. But if you copy many person's words, it's research. <laughs> so retirement is wonderful if you have two essentials, much to live on and much to live for. Great quote. You know, our quote is even better. Live life today, be confident about tomorrow. Thank you very much um, for all of you that attended. I know there's more questions and comments or whatever. Um, if you can't get your questions in during this time, you know, feel free to contact us or, you know, email, phone call, whatever and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. We realize that, uh, you know, we're speaking here from 30,000 feet and we're painting with a very broad brush because, you know, we don't know who's on the other side of, of the line here. And some of this stuff may have been applicable to some of you and may not have. And you might have personal situations that you don't want to share in public and we'll make ourselves available. But keep in mind, everything that we discussed today OK, you may already have a financial advisor. You may already know one. I mean, what we're talking about today, even when we're talking about, you know, uh, professional help, um, this is not a commercial. OK, you can get help from any qualified person. OK, um, we just happen to be one of many. So thank you very much again for your help, for your help. People on the panel, for your help, uh, Jerry and Christina, and for all that you all you who attended. Uh, thanks for taking your time out. We have one quick question, Al, that uh, I'll bring up for those uh, retirees who want to move out of New Jersey. What states would you suggest? Um, no, it's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, you know quite a few of our clients, uh, Christina and Al, end up heading south. Um, and you know, one of the most popular destinations is a state that has no income tax, um, Florida, right? So um, when you look at uh, where, you know, is the right location for you, you can pick almost any state south of New Jersey and get tax relief. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, many uh, move to the Carolinas. Um, although South Carolina has an income tax, it's uh, less than New Jersey's. Right. So, um, you know, I think um, the cost of living also uh, is significantly less than uh, the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. Um, and so we, we do help our clients decide what is uh, the right place for them. Uh, as we found out, the right place for our clients typically is where the grandkids are. So uh, although they may want to <laughs> head to a different state. It seems to be where the grandkids are. I was going to say the same. Yeah, I, I was just going to add the same. Uh, you know, we, we try not to let the tax tail wag the dog. Um, so just allowing the client to choose where, where they want to live and where their family and loved ones are. Uh, perhaps a hobby calls you to that area or the weather, you know, something that you enjoy doing. Um, so that's really where, where we try to plan. It's not so much for the tax but more for the lifestyle, for, for what you've worked so hard your entire working career to achieve. Um, and that's the goal of retirement. Yeah, uh, Christina, great minds think alike. That's exactly what I was gonna say. You know, find out, you know, what do you want? When you say, where should I move? What do you want? Uh, do you want, is weather important? Is, is taxes important? Taxes might not be important. Um, uh, if, if you wanna sit by the fire, at night drinking hot cocoa, looking at the snow, do not move to Florida. <laughs> well, I think that uh, kind of wraps it up for us. Jerry, Christina, 
Al, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you joining us tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and found it valuable. Of course, if you have any questions, please reach out to us um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you all. Bye.